Welcome, 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 everybody. I am going to launch our first poll. Pink. All right. So for everybody who is joining, first, I hope you will notice the land acknowledgement statement that we have at the beginning of each of our webinars in this series. Um, also, I hope you can see this poll. Um, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Where are you coming from? Are you from Maine? Are you from somewhere else in the New England region? Are you from outside New England? Or are you from Canada? Um, we didn't give an option if you're from beyond New England or Canada. Um, what, uh, let's see, and then what background brings you to the meeting? So check all that apply, please. We'd love to learn a little bit more about your background. And we're really curious how familiar you are with the Penobscot Experimental Forest. So again, we're gonna get the real, the heart of the meeting started in just a few moments here. If you're just joining us, we invite you to read our land acknowledgement statement. And we are also uh, hoping you can take a quick moment and fill out this poll um, to give us, give our speakers a sense of who you are. We'll be getting started in just a minute here. It looks like, ooh, 70% of participants have participated. Going up, going up. This is exciting. When my watch turns over to 1202, I am going to close the poll. Actually, I don't have a second counter, so maybe I'll just start counting backwards of 10. We have 84% have participated. Okay, you have another 10 seconds. And then I will close the poll and we will share the results. Five, four, three, two, one. Think. Okay. So for our speakers today and for everybody here, um, where are you from? 54% of you are hailing from Maine, 33% are coming from somewhere in the New England region. Uh, five of you are from outside of New England and we have two Canadians, welcome. Okay, and what background brings you to this meeting? This will help our speakers get a sense of your, um, of kind of what perspectives you're bringing to today's discussion. 54% um, identify as foresters, 19% um, as scientists, almost as many as another kind of natural resource professional. Um, we have 12% that are interested public and a few that are just other. So that's kind of the perspectives that we have for today. Um, and the, another question, are you familiar with the Penobscot Experimental Forest? 62% of folks on this webinar have been there. Um, others, about 10% have heard of it, but never visited. Um, and others have just heard of it and others haven't heard of it. So with that, hopefully that helps our speakers get a little bit of a background um, on who is in the, in the room with us today. So welcome and uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Aaron Weiskettle. Thanks, Amanda, and thanks everyone for joining us. We're very excited to kick off this webinar series. Again, this is kind of our third iteration of the Forest Climate Change Initiative uh, Science and Practice. Um, we held a forum when we used to be able to get back in person. Last year, we did a, a multi-part monthly series on a variety of issues. Uh, and this time around, uh, we're doing a kind of hybrid um, five-stop uh, show. Uh, if you haven't checked out the series website, I did just post it in the chat. Um, again, this is centered around science and practice, largely to talk about climate change and the issues that we're facing. Uh, this this uh, series is focused on the primary forest types across Maine. Uh, so we're very excited to host Laura Kenefek, Keith Ganodi, uh, Alessio Martitelli, as well as uh, Kenny Ferguson to talk about this. On Friday, we'll be making a trip to the Penobscot Experimental Forest to see some of this stuff actually in person that Laura and Keith will highlight. Um, we're very excited uh, to have this going. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everyone, and, and this is the first get go. Um, Amanda will talk through some of the uh, agenda and what we'll cover today, and then we'll turn it over to our distinguished uh, panel. I did want to formally introduce the panel that is joining us. Uh, so Laura Kinefic is the research forester with the US Forest Service at the Penobscot Experimental Forest. Keith Kenodi is at the University of Maine and works as the uh, forester for the university lands at well over 15,000 acres. Um, Kenny Ferguson is a district forester for Penobscot County uh, with the Maine Forest Service. And then Alessio Mortatelli is a faculty member in the wildlife department here at the University of Maine. So with that, Amanda, uh, have at it. 
Awesome, thank you. And I do want to reiterate, especially today, uh, as we're talking about the Penobscot Experimental Forest, um, the, our land acknowledgement statement, we, we do want to respectfully acknowledge that the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn land, are the original stewards of these forests that we're discussing today. The University of Maine is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, uh, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. The University's Center on research for, uh, for Research on Sustainable Forests supports forest research and education in the homelands of the Penobscot Nation and other Wabanaki tribal nations. We strongly support the inclusion of Indigenous science and values in forest stewardship, management, and research. So with that, um, I want to give a little bit of an outline of what we're going to be talking about because issues that have stretched into the past are certainly stretching into the present and we have a lot to learn from each other um, as stewards of today and stewards into the future. So from, for today, you're going to hear from this uh, diverse panel on climate change impacts on the spruce fir forest type and the outcomes of some long-term research at the PEF, Penobscot Experimental Forest. Um, our speakers have a highly engaging presentation for you, and we might throw in a poll or two to make sure you're paying attention. Please use the chat window for any questions, and I'll keep an eye on that, and we will address those after the presentation portion. So let me turn it over to Laura, and then I think then to Keith after that. Hey, hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Okay, do you see my screen? If somebody could let me know. Yep, I'm that's good. Ask. Okay, thank you. Just move these out of the way. Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you a bit today about the Penobscot Experimental Forest and some of the research that the US Forest Service is doing there. Now, normally when we do these things, we meet in the forest and we look at things um, in person and it really helps us to understand uh, what's going on and the recommendations and questions that we're talking about. Um, today, we're going to uh, just be looking at sort of a virtual presentation of that. And some of you will be joining us in the field later this week. So the context for this is that Today we're talking about the spruce fir forests in the Northeast. And here I have a map um, from Forest Inventory and Analysis, the part of the US Forest Service that monitors the changes in our forest. And what we see here is the spruce fir forest in yellow. And so that's distributed in most of Maine and other parts of Northern New England and New York. So the star shows the location of the experimental forest. And this is only about 15 minutes here from the University of Maine in central Maine. And that's kind of on the bottom of the spruce fir forest type. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation. So the Penobscot Experimental Forest was established in 1950 by the US Forest Service. It's one of more than 80 nationwide. So these are places set aside for research. And although many of them are associated with national forests, this one here in um, central Maine isn't. And so it was originally on industry land and it is now owned by the University of Maine Foundation. And you're gonna be hearing not only from me, but from my university colleagues today on the work that they have going on. So when the forest was first laid out, here's a map of it from the late 1940s. They did an inventory at the time and they recorded that it was primarily what we call second growth conifer dominated forest. So this wasn't old growth. It was um, trees that had been growing back from previous cutting over the 100 years or so before that. Um, and there was a lot of the eastern hemlock, spruce, fir, and other conifer species in mixture with some hardwood. So I have a couple of pictures here from 1950 that show the sorts of conditions on the forest when we got started. So here's a map of the forest today. And what this shows is that over the last 70 plus years, we, um, both the Forest Service and the university have gone out and put in a number of long-term research studies. And so all of these 
sort of geometric units that you see on there in different colors are different types of management that has been applied and studied over time. So we in the Forest Service started out looking primarily on spruce for management, but recognizing that these species were in mixtures with others, and we continue that today. So we have a number of studies as you've seen, but the one I'm gonna focus on today and that we're going to visit this Friday is called the Compartment Management Study. And a compartment is just an old forest management term for um, an area of the forest that has been um, designated for management. So this covers a thousand acres and it has a number of different treatments that have been applied that we're gonna talk about. And again, here are some photos that show what it was like when we started. So this was 85% softwoods, so this is coniferous species. The majority spruce fir, but also an important amount of hemlock and other, and 15% hardwoods, mostly red maple. Now, this proportion of spruce fir reflects where that star was on the map that I showed you. We are in the spruce fir forest, we're at the southern edge of it. So we have a mixture of different species that's range limits are overlapping. And so that means this is a really important forest to, for us to think about climate change because at the range limits of species, we're likely to see a lot of change. So when I talk about the compartment study conceptually, we have different approaches to management that we've investigated. And there are a lot of, um, different variations of the treatments, but they generally fall into a few large categories. So if we start with a stand that looks like this, um, expertly drawn to show different sizes, ages, and species of trees, one of the things we always look at in research is if you don't do anything. So that's the no management option. In the compartment study, we have three other broad categories of management that we have been studying. So these fall into the categories of uneven age silviculture, even age silviculture, and exploitive harvesting. So I don't wanna to get too caught up on terminology today, but I just wanna define a couple of these things so that we're all on the same page going forward. Uneven age silviculture is when you manage a stand through periodic harvests so that you have many different ages and sizes of trees all the time. So you never remove all the trees at once. Even age silviculture is when you would remove all the trees over a short period of time for the purpose of having a new stand that's all one age. And then we have another category that we call exploitive harvesting. And this is where you just sell the trees that are the most valuable or that are, you are able to sell at a time. You don't really have a de deliberate plan for the future. So there's three treatments that I'm gonna to mention today and that we're gonna take a look at later this week include single tree selection cutting. So that's selecting individual trees to remove on a cycle, say 10 or 20 years in the forest. Even age silviculture in the form of shelter wood where you remove all the large trees over a period of usually 10 to less than 20 years. So your new trees get established in the shade then you remove those large trees. And then exploitive cutting, we're gonna look at something called commercial clear cutting. And I just wanna take a second and distinguish this from what we as silviculturists, so people who manage forests for certain desired outcomes would call a silvicultural clear cut. So a silvicultural clear cut is something we do when we wanna remove all the trees to have a new stand that starts it later. So that could be by planting or from sprouts. Commercial clear cutting is just a logging term. And it means that you clear cut or cut and sold everything that was merchantable at a time. And that's a form of high grading. It's known through past research to have a degrading effect on the forest. Okay, there are some other treatments that are being conducted in the spruce fir forest and that are being studied by folks. This includes clear cutting and planting. And here's a really nice photo of that from New Brunswick strip clear cutting, different forms of selection and shelter wood with different arrangements of tree removal or larger or smaller gaps, and some new ecological approaches that use gaps that expand over time. I'm not gonna focus on these today, although I will briefly mention the strip clear cut, 
which is one of the ones that we'll see Friday in which my colleague Keith Kenodi is gonna to talk to us about after my presentation. So doing these different types of management created really different outcomes in terms of stand structure and composition. So if you think about those photos that I showed in the last few slides of what this forest was like when we started, these are some photos that show what the forest is like today in places where we've used these different approaches. And you can see that they're really different in the sizes of trees, their arrangement, and the species that are there. And this has important implications for climate. So this graph is about carbon stocks. So when we think about mitigating climate change, there are two ways that forests have been contributing to this. One is by storing carbon in the forest, and that's what we call stocks. And the other is uptake of carbon or removing carbon from the atmosphere and that's sequestration. So this graph, which I wanna share with you is from a paper led by my colleague, Josh Pulik. And I have the citations on the bottom of the slides. And he used our data to look at the amount of carbon that was stored in the forest after 65 years of management. And what he found, and this is for me megagrams of carbon per hectare, but the actual Y values on the Y axis aren't as important for the point I wanna make as the relative difference between them. So we have gray is the carbon that's above the ground in trees, and brown is the carbon that is below the ground in soils and roots. So in the reference, which is where we didn't do any harvesting, he found the most carbon on the site in year 65. However, selection cutting, so that's that removal of a few trees periodically, so you never cut the whole forest at once, also had what we would call high stocking, so carrying a lot of trees, not as much as the unmanaged stand. And here, our carbon storage isn't just above the ground and below the ground, but it's in the products that we harvested and turned into wood that was used for paper or for houses. Similarly, the shelter wood, and here's a picture of that, where we established a new even age stand and didn't do any other harvesting to it since then, was very dense and had a similar amount of carbon standing in it after 65 years. That commercial clear cut, so the very heavy cut where we cut everything that we could sell a couple of times, that had the lowest carbon stocks when we compare these different treatments. But there's more to mitigating climate than just the amount of carbon that's in the forest. And so I mentioned sequestration or uptake. And here my colleague looked at that in terms of the net change in carbon. So that's how much it's uptaking every year over the long term. And here he used not only the data we observed for 70 years, but he modeled it forward to 100 years. And what he found when he did that is that the rate of uptake of carbon, so removing it from the atmosphere, was just as high in that selection stand, the uneven age stand, and the shelter wood where we didn't do any thinning as it was in the unmanaged stand. So when it comes to taking carbon out of the atmosphere, these two approaches to management look very promising. The other treatment that I'm gonna mention here, and I'm not gonna get into all the ones that aren't um, have rectangles around them, I'm just focusing on these today, is that commercial clear cut where we cut everything we could sell, we had low stocking, and actually that one's not taking as much carbon out of the atmosphere as these other approaches. But there's more to mitigation to think about when we're talking about climate change. And one of the things that really matters is how our forests in the future are going to be able to withstand novel conditions that we're anticipating that are already starting to occur. So these are some data provided to us by my Forest Service colleague, um, Anantha Prasad, and which can be found in the Climate Change Tree Atlas, which um, is available online. And this shows the predicted change in suitable habitat for some of the very common species that we're gonna see on the PEF under two different climate change modeling scenarios. The first is if we have low emissions and the other is if we have high emissions. So the high emission scenario is the more or worse climate change scenario. And what we see here is either um, no change for a couple species, but primarily, a small decrease in suitable habitat 
for those what I would call northern conifers. So these are balsam fir, red spruce, eastern hemlock, and northern white cedar. So those are all shade tolerant, slow growing, moisture requiring species. We see a greater proportion of the species showing an increase in suitable habitat. So this isn't necessarily how much of the species there will be, it's whether the habitat will be more or less suitable for them. In the Penobscot watershed, the hardwood species are looking like they're going to have more favorable um, habitat conditions in the future. There is an additional consideration here, and that is not only whether the habitat itself will be suitable for these species, but what is coming their way in terms of what we would call um, damaging agents or other considerations. So here's a map from the Maine Forest Service, and it shows um, current distribution of hemlock woolly adelgid detections. This is um, an invasive pest that defoliates and causes mortality of eastern hemlock, and it's been spreading up the coast. And in fact, we look at um, a recent, so this was, I think, 2020, it's shown on the map. Um, this is a detection of the hemlock woolly adelgid on Mount Desert Island, which is just about one hour away from the experimental forest where this work is being done. So that means, just as an example, some of these species are going to have other things going on that are gonna be problematic in the future. So if we keep that in mind, that really kind of separates out these long-lived, slow-growing species that are um, conifers and which historically have been very prevalent in this forest type and are characteristic of the spruce fir forest at the southern part of its range. These are species that we have concerns about going forward. I also mentioned there's other disturbance um, impacts that are happening. One is the balsam woolly adelgid an insect pest that causes defoliation and mortality of balsam fir. Again, this is an invasive or introduced insect pest that was previously restricted to the coast. But with climate change, we have seen it moving north and inland, and we have been having mortality from this on our forests. We are also are having increasing incidence of wind throw. So this is a photograph on our forest of one of our university forest colleagues with a number of trees that fell over during a storm on Halloween. Those of you in Maine might remember it. This was the bomb cyclone of 2018 that happened um, right at the end of October. And so these extreme weather events, the um, moving in of invasive pests that we didn't have before are all affecting the decisions that we need to make about forest management. So this is a graph that shows the change in species composition over time in the three treatments that I've been focusing on today. And I wanna just note that the, for today, the red maple and the other hardwoods, they're on the top in red and yellow. And those conifer species, the softwood species are the blues and the greens. And basically the take home here is with that uneven aged management, the repeated light cutting, we increase spruce and hemlock which are two species that we have concerns about as far as availability of future habitat. Shelter wood cutting without the thinning increased fir and pine. Now that's interesting because pine is a species where we do anticipate increases in suitable habitat. Fir, not so much. The commercial clear cutting increased fir and hardwoods. So here's where we see more of those species that seem to be expected to do well in the future, in addition to fir, which is not expected to do well. But that was the one that had the lowest carbon stocks and the lowest sequestration. So there are different things to think about here. One other aspect of this that I wanna mention before I wrap this up and turn it over to my colleague from the University Forest is that all of us involved in forest management know that whether you want to create a certain wildlife habitat or generate timber to sell or firewood for your home, we're often managing forests actively. And so one of the things that people think about is the financial value. Sometimes we need to earn money just to pay the taxes on our forest land or um, commercial forest land management requires on sustainable production of um, value over time. So looking at the three treatments that I showed you today, 
the selection cutting, the shelter wood without thinning and the commercial clear cut, we see that the value of the trees that we harvested over 65 years was most in that shelter wood. And that's because we took all the trees off right in the beginning over a few cuts to have that new stand come along. However, when we look at the value of the trees in the forest today, that was highest in the selection stand. That's where we retained a lot of the large trees and did light partial cuts. So when you add it together, the value of what we earned and the value of what we still have, that selection approach looks pretty good. Now these results are different if you do discounting to bring these values back to the year that you started, which is something that folks that are investing in timberlands need to do. And there, that commercial clear cut looked like it was more beneficial because you got a lot of your money right up front. So depending on how you value your forest and the time frame at which you look at it, you see different results. Then if we include this with the climate change mitigation information, so we know that the selection cutting was looking pretty good for carbon stocks and carbon sequestration, that would suggest hmm, maybe that's the direction we wanna go in. But at the same time, that was the one that maintained most of those species that we are expected to have less habitat for in the future because they're not expected to be as adaptive to the future climate. The only other thing that I will mention with regard to that is when we look at the value of a forest, it depends on what the prices are that are being paid for the wood at a time when um, it is sold or if you're valuing the standing timber of the current markets. So this is a map in Maine that shows the distribution of mills. Um, this is from a paper by my colleague, Mindy Crandall. And it shows that right here in the middle of Maine, which is where we are and where the Penobscot um, Experimental Forest is, we have lost a number of pulp and paper mills during the early, um, the 2000s to the 2010s. The effect of this, if we look at the graph on the right, so this is price per cord for stumpage of pulp wood, so paper use, wood used for paper over time, starting from the 1990s, we see we had coming into it, spruce and burr um, pulp wood valued much higher than hardwoods. That is historically the trend in Maine. And in fact, back in the day on the experimental forest, they were going around and just killing hardwoods and leaving them standing there because the value was in the spruce and fir. But with this change in the availability to sell the wood with the loss of these mills, which is a very dynamic situation that can continue in the future, we saw a complete flip-flop of these prices where suddenly hardwoods became more valuable in spruce and fir. So there's a lot of stuff to think about here. Much of this information is presented in a new publication that's called Managing Your Woodland. This is forestry research translated for landowners. This is a tool for those of you who are not experts in forestry to be able to learn more about these different um, treatments and the effects that they have. And for folks working with foresters to be able, or with landowners to share with them. This is in press right now and it will be available in the coming year on the tree search website from the US Forest Service. Okay, so bringing it all together, we saw, and we're gonna look closely on Friday, different carbon storage adaptation and climate and market resilience from these different treatments. So the question is, how do we balance those competing demands? And that's something we're gonna talk about in the rest of our webinar today. We're gonna to think about the trade-offs, recreation or aesthetics, wildlife habitat and operations. So with that, I will thank you for sticking with me as we had that overview and turn it over to someone else. Fantastic, thank you so much, Laura, for that excellent background. I know we have a couple of questions, but we're gonna hold them uh, for the, for the Q&A section. So Keith, if you'd like to share your screen, then you can pick up where Laura left off. Thank you. Sure thing. Okay, hi everybody. Keith Kenody, University Forest Manager. Um, I'm just really going to give a brief teaser um, for the field study, um, talk a little bit about operations on a site um, that we're going to visit in, in, the, uh, in the tour, um, specifically the, uh, the strip clear cut site, um, which ended up being about 27 acres of, uh, of clear cut. Um, obviously, um, anyone who works in the woods knows that um, 
weather uh, patterns have, have been different over the last few years. Um, and all the modeling shows us that they'll continue to be, to be different and perhaps more, more challenging. Um, and technology has also changed um, over, the, over the decades. Um, so we're always faced with, with new situations. And I'm, I'm just gonna give an example of this uh, strip clear cut um, that we'll be going to with some photos from the 1970s um, showing that just because it was 50 years ago, the weather and the operations didn't always go the way we wanted to um, versus what we did um, just a, a few years ago under some challenging situations. All right, um, so this is our um, uh, strip clear cut site. Um, in between the strips was a shelter wood harvest done in the 1970s. Um, so we had clear cut strips and then immediately adjacent to them, um, some shelter wood harvesting. Um, as you can see, anyone who knows about the soils in this part of Maine, um, part of our site is on this marine, what we call marine, marine deposits, marine clay. Um, very fine textured, no rocks, very susceptible um, to rutting damage. Um, so here is our 1970s harvest. Um, again, in those, um, I think the, uh, the clear cut strip is right there. Um, and the, uh, the shelter wood harvest is here. Um, using relatively, or actually by today's standards, very small equipment. Um, anyone who's been in the woods in Maine, taking a look at the color of the foliage there, um, knows this was probably a pretty lousy time of year to be on fine textured marine clay. Um, probably middle of October, uh, wet, um, not a lot of evapotranspiration going on, soils get wet and stay wet and fail quite easily. So even though it was 50 years ago, um, still had challenges with small equipment of the day. Um, and um, um, probably some uh, questionable timing of the harvest. Um, just setting, setting the scale here, um, that's a picture of a tree farmer C4, um, which was the, the skitter used um, in the 70s. Um, and this is what we used in 2018, a uh, large grapple skitter. I had to get a picture with some people um, for scale. Um, so, Things have changed considerably with equipment that we use, um, with equipment availability um, and um, potential impact. But um, I would maintain planned and executed um, properly. Um, we can use equipment like this to our advantage um, and have good outcomes. On this particular harvest, um, we used what's known as a hybrid system. Um, which basically means um, we have one machine to cut the trees, uh, another machine to process the trees in the woods, and a third machine to bring them out. Um, in this case, partly because of some of the research requirements, um, we ended up with sort of a, a little bit non-traditional hybrid system. Um, we used a feller buncher, followed up by a stroke delimmer, which delimmed the trees um, in the woods. Um, and then the grapple skitter, um, which brought them out, out roadside. Um, a lot of times modern hybrid systems involve a processor, uh, a feller buncher and a forwarder. Um, but again, part of, this, part of the reason we did this um, was because of some of the research goals um, that we had on the site. And um, also working in a clear cut allowed us to use the, the stroke delimmer where in a partial harvest, that would be more problematic because that um, needs a lot of room uh, to operate. Um, so in comparison to the 1970s, um, we operated in the wintertime, um, which was definitely an advantage, um, but the winter conditions were still poor. Um, we had a lot of uh, rain on snow that winter, uh, a lot of thaws midwinter. Um, so even with using winter to our advantage, um, on these fine textured soils that we had, we, we still started to have, uh, have problems. Um, but um, the logger came up with a kind of a novel solution, at least for this part of the world, um, which is actually used in other parts of the world um, quite a bit. Um, and that was to use the round wood that we were harvesting 
um, almost all pulpwood in this case, basically to make a temporary skid road to skid across um, to decrease ground pressure. Um, and um, at the end, um, the last trip out, the skidder picked up the, uh, the round wood that it had skidded across behind it. Um, and then it was brought out and uh, merchandised and sold. Um, so, you know, comparing to 1970, tiny skidder, bad time of year. Um, I think we made less impact with an enormous skidder, better time of year, and some, uh, some better thinking about how to actually in execute the harvest um, from, a, from a ground disturbance um, BMP standpoint. Um, so that's what we'll be looking at um, out in the field. We'll look at that site. Um, and certainly conditions are getting more challenging, um, but I think with some thought and some planning and some people um, who are willing to sort of work with the situation they're handed and come up with creative solutions, um, we can have a, have a good result um, because, you know, compared to that teeny tiny skitter 50 years ago, I think we had actually less site disturbance um, this go around. Um, so that's all I have, um, just really a, a teaser for the field tour. Um, and I will uh, send it along, I think, to the next, next person. Awesome, thank you so much, Keith. And we're looking forward to hearing more about operations on Friday. So Alessio is gonna pick up next, and I think he was gonna provide um, a little bit of a wildlife perspective and how certain species of wildlife fit into the ecosystem that we'll be looking at. Go ahead, Alessio. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alessio Mortelliti. I'm a professor in wildlife ecology at the University of Maine. So we've been working in the PEF for the past uh, six years, and we've been looking at, in particular, at how different silvicultural practices affect uh, mammals, and in particular, uh, small mammals, and we're now starting to look at the implications with climate change. So the reason we work on small mammals is that they have a really important critical role in ecosystems. They, they have this dual role, dual role where they're both predators of seeds, so they can affect negatively forest regeneration, but they're also dispersers for some uh, species of uh, plants. Besides this, they're also very important prey items, so a lot of top predators, lynx, martin, fisher, etc., rely on small mammals. Uh, and they're also very important for as vectors for disease, for example, uh, Lyme disease. So uh, out of all the research we've been conducting for the past six years, some things have become really obvious to us. The, one, the first thing is that the way you manage the forest has huge impacts on the two key resources uh, animals need, so food and cover. And what was surprising is the magnitude of the effect. So the way you manage forests can change the density of small mammals by different orders of magnitude, depending on how you, the type of uh, treatment. This in turn may have sort of cascade effects on the ecosystem. For example, if you increase the abundance on small mammals, some plants may be negatively affected because small mammals really target their seeds. For example, white pine, spruce, hemlock, these are seeds that small mammals uh, absolutely love, and they tend to predate, they tend to uh, cons consume them immediately. So they basically kill a potential uh, plant. With climate change, we expect that these effects are going to possibly become even more negative, and that's because uh, more periods without snow means they have more time to find these seeds and so to predate more upon them. And their ability to locate these seeds is absolutely amazing. We're doing experiments where you hide a white pine seed, you covered it with earth, and within uh, 24 to 48 hours, a small mammal has located and predated that seed. Other plants such as balsam fir, paper birch, cedar, uh, small mammals tend to have a more neutral effect. They may consume the seeds, but uh, in a small amounts. Their target is really white pine, spruce, hemlock. Uh, you, it's very hard to see the, these effects because small mammals work at night, they're tiny, they're very, so unless you're really studying this process, it's very easy to overlook the importance. But what I always emphasize is they, they really act like a, like a filter, uh, they're kind of gatekeepers. So they're controlling the regrowth of some species and they're favoring uh, some others. Uh, so in terms of climate change, one thing we're working on and we're understanding is that uh, in the future, the role of small mammals may become even more important, in particular when it comes to hardwood or species such as oaks and hickories. 
So oaks and hickories really depend on uh, wildlife, particularly small mammals for dispersing their seeds. In this case, this role of small mammals, rather than being more negative, so more predatory, is actually more positive in terms of they, they predate some seeds, but they also help disperse in others. So what's going to happen in the future with an increase in the proportion of hardwood, the role of small mammals, I forecast, is going to be even more, uh, more important, and we're going to see more sort of uh, positive interactions. Uh, on Friday, I will... Um, be there and I'll try to emphasize and show how certain types of uh, management can favor some small mammal species, which in turn can favor some kind of regeneration, whereas other practices may not favor other, other species. Uh, and with that, I'll leave the floor to the next speaker. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we have so much to learn this Friday, and we are a little bit tight on time. Um, however, uh, Kenny, do you have any additional thoughts you wanted to add at this point? Uh, if I can start my video. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, I'm there. Well, um, I think from the, the point of view from a district forester with the Maine Forest Service, uh, some of my thinking is that uh, there's just so much variety and, and abilities out there to look at, study and understand. And then uh, one of my tasks is to help landowners basically make informed decisions, help loggers with their decisions as well. So trying to understand uh, the options out there um, to conduct sensible management is, is interesting. I'm really looking forward to the the field to, to see how things are there. And uh, as I'm going through this journey and, and everyone else is of trying to understand where the climate's going, how to best to be uh, maybe changing our practices a little bit to make us more resilient, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. So I, I don't really have anything important to say. It's just stimulating so many questions, uh, uh, looking for answers at this point. Great, thank you, Kenny. And I'm glad we'll have you there on Friday. Um, so I wanted to just launch a quick poll and, uh, and see what you all out there have been taking in from this. And this might, uh, before we get into everybody's questions, um, this, this might actually tie to uh, some of Kenny's discussion, which is that there's a lot of really cool science going on. And how do we translate this uh, to landowners and people that are making decisions on even smaller parcels in spruce fir forest um, around the state? So if you have a moment, please fill out the, uh, the little poll here and please add your questions to the chat window. Uh, this is where I should be playing some Jeopardy theme music. Um, but in the meantime, uh, please take a moment and fill out the poll quiz um, and, uh, and also add your questions to the chat window. We had some good questions come in already um, and thanks to Laura and Aaron for addressing some of those already. Um, I think we will uh, we'll pick up with, I saw Fred's question was unanswered so far. Um, and so we'll probably start with that. And if you have other questions uh, for our speakers, please type them into the chat window. And Laura, if you're scrolling back to Fred's question, just so you can be ready to answer. Um, at 1220, he asked, can you manage a forest that has been high graded to improve carbon uptake? If so, do you have any options for appropriate management? So we'll start with that question in just a moment. I'm going to give people another 10 seconds to complete our poll slash quiz, uh, and then we'll move on. So five, four, three, two, one, bink. Okay, so let's see how well people did. So from your perspective, what are the potential impacts of climate change on the spruce fir forest type in Maine? and people were only allowed to choose one. And about half thought that the impacts were gonna be mostly negative and then a little over a third thought that um, they, were, they could be both positive and negative. And 15% said it's too difficult to predict. So um, when compared to other forest types, how vulnerable is the spruce, is spruce fir in Maine? Um, so uh, every, most people thought that it, it was either highly vulnerable or moderately vulnerable compared to other forest types in Maine. So definitely interesting there. Um, and what might be the most effective management strategy for spruce fir in the face of climate change? 
we might want to ask people this again after Friday's tour as well, once they've had a chance to see some of these in person. But we got a really good spectrum here. Um, but if we have a quorum, uh, then it would probably be the balance of even age and unaged management was what folks were choosing here. So um, Laura, do you want to start us off with any reflections on the poll or in answering Fred's question? I guess I'll just say based on what I saw in the poll, I mean, I, I was encouraged by that. And I think that shows, um, I think the science supports some of the things people are sort of thinking at this point, which is that, you know, different types of management and basically result in a diverse forest. And that's one of the things we'll talk about on Friday is how diversity and a lot of different attributes can be very helpful when we're going into an uncertain future. So yeah, I'm looking forward to drilling down on that. Um, I had, we had a question um, about what to do about the cutover stands, right? So we saw that that one wasn't doing super great as far as either carbon sequestration or carbon stocks. You know, this is a really interesting question. Um, it gets to what we call rehabilitation, um, which, you know, sort of means what it sounds like, which is trying to bring a forest back to a more productive um, condition. And we differentiate that from restoration, which is often used to describe when we try to bring a forest back to a condition maybe it was in before European settlement, we really start to change it. Rehabilitation is trying to re restore some values to a forest that we have lost through our, our past management that have to do with um, meeting people's goals for production. And as far as carbon uptake, this one is a little bit of a tough nut to crack. Part of the reason why I think we do not have as much of the carbon stocks and carbon sequestration in there as some of the other treatments is because the stocking is lower. Um, there just aren't as many trees there. At the same time, there are many trees that are short-lived or are poor vigor and not growing well because we sold all the ones that were the best ones. And so in that context, doing some what we would call intermediate treatments such as thinning to try to redistribute growing space to the better trees could increase their growth, their longevity, and the development of products that could then be used for longer lived things like wood to build your house instead of just paper that you could make out of maybe small or poorly formed trees. So I think that the long term solution is to implement some treatments to try to improve the growth of the best trees and grow trees of larger sizes over the long term. But that would mean in the short term, we might have to do a little bit of thinning, which would further decrease the amount of trees on the site that are taking up carbon. So there might be like a little dip and then maybe an increase longer. And we're gonna look at that on Friday. So that'll be something to talk about more. Fantastic. Thank you for that great answer to that, to a really good question, Laura. Um, I'd like our other speakers to turn your cameras on if you haven't already. And Alessio, a question has come in for you in the meantime. Uh, Jim is asking, he says, I would love to hear what Alessio has to say about the impacts of herbivores, deer, on species composition in the face of climate change. And everyone, please type your questions in the chat. Thank you. So um, take this as an opinion. This is, of course, a topic where we then more research is needed. But in general, I would say, my my prediction is it's going to become worse so it's going to reduce diversity unless we start facilitating the sort of an increase in predators that can keep prey like prey like such as deer density lower we do see an increase in coyote in maine but mostly in the central southern we've just finished a, a survey across the state of Maine and there's definitely coyotes in the north of Maine but the density is still uh, low. So to answer your question is I think the impacts are going to be negative in terms of of course higher density, lower, more impact of uh, sort of grazing and the way to manage this is to increase the density of predators in my opinion. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Alessio. Um, folks, you're still, you still have time to ask your questions of all these experts right now, even if you can't make the tour on Friday. So make the most of it. Um, ah, Jocelyn popped in with a great question. Let's see, what is the approximate breakdown of current forest management in the main logging industry today? In other words, to what degree of loggers already adapted sustainable forest management techniques? Anybody wanna take a crack at that one? Uh, that's an interesting one. I, I... 
I think that if you look at the areas that are under green certification, that gives an indication of, of sustainable forestry and long-term management goals and objectives. And that, that in terms of the, the landowners who are the, of the larger persuasion in, in terms of more area is quite substantial, so. Keith, I'm curious from, from your opinion, you've seen a bit of the state before you got kind of docked at the university for us. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, I mean, like the forest itself, I think there's a, a range from top to bottom. Um, and, but I will, I will agree strongly with uh, Kenny that um, certification um, where it exists and where people utilize it have not only certified practices, but it's also raised the bar um, higher for management across the state as a general general rule. Thank you, Keith. And uh, Bren popped into the chat, uh, just a comment um, in response. He says, 50 to 60 years ago here in Vermont, industry, mostly paper companies, treated balsam fir and spruce the same. For example, uses in mills, stumpage prices, values, et cetera. So another perspective. Thank you, Bren. Uh, anybody else want to chime in on that question? We have another one that popped in. I've, I've got a, a quick slant on things, yeah. uh, Amanda, in terms of um, the abilities of different ownerships to perform different management styles. Uh, and one would be the question about pre-commercial thinning and uh, whether or not that would be a, a useful tool to help with this question. Um, my thoughts are that the, the larger ownerships basically have uh, a little bit easier just through economies of scale of, of putting that out on the landscape, um, whereas smaller landowners might not have the economies of scale to help. But I think it might be something that's very worthwhile looking at. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, Aaron, were you going to unmute and add to that? OK, sorry. Um, I, I'm uh, multitasking here. Uh, there's some, there are a couple of good questions that have come in, um, but I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions that were submitted uh, in, uh, as folks registered, and I'm keeping an eye on the clock, don't worry. Um, that, uh, Kenny, your response actually feeds into a question that uh, one of our registrants had. He says, we currently focus, and this is for all of you, um, we currently focus on climate-related silviculture, but should we really be focusing on operational management, especially water and new and innovative ways to get logging equipment in and out of the woods, uh, you know, bridge siting and set up an appropriate size machines. And um, I'll add, uh, that's from someone who works for a wildlife agency. So this has uh, multiple contexts. Anybody wanna answer that? I, I, can take a, I can take a crack at it. Um, I think when it comes to this stuff, it's sort of, we need everything in the toolbox. Um, so um, using equipment we already have in innovative ways, uh, making modifications to equipment, um, you know, for the operational reasons, um, you know, having um, you know, what, what Laura's talking about is, you know, developing forests that are more resilient to the climate in, in general and give us more flexibility um, with our markets and things like that. So, you know, if, if market A is not good and that's the wet sites, maybe we can go to market B um, that is on some of the drier sites to have that in our portfolio. So I, I really think that's an, that's an all of the above, above thing. And, you know, I, I will say too that operationally, I think that every possible combination of equipment that exists, someone out there is making it work for their particular situation. Um, and, you know, I've seen, I've seen everything. So um, individual people come up with creative and individual ways to make, to make things work. So. Great. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of great responses to questions and links that are being uh, uh, dropped into the chat window as well. Um, let me see, I'm trying to think what we have time for uh, in the last few minutes here. Uh, boy, I'm, I, I'm, now I think we're not going to be able to get all of the questions um, that people have popped in the chat, and I do apologize for that. Um, 
Meg is sharing a question that one of our registrants had asked. So maybe a final round from each of you, just quickly. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity related to forests and climate change in Maine? And feel free to, you know, speaking from the spruce fir context and from the context of your, your work or your research or the, the people that you serve. Biggest challenge and biggest opportunity, Laura. Um, oh, oh no, I'm not muted, sorry. <laughs> um, I think the biggest challenge for me is, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, balancing the different aspects of how do we create a forest that is resilient to future climates and to future markets, and at the same time, is doing a good job of uptaking carbon and storing it so we can reduce those impacts in the future. So that balance to me is the biggest challenge in the spruce fir type because some of the ones good for one thing aren't necessarily good for another. Um, I think the biggest opportunity we have is that the Northern forest as a whole, not just in Maine, but elsewhere, is a working forest that supports rural economies. And we have um, interest and support for continuing to manage our forests in a way that I think will allow us to make some important adjustments, to species composition, to structure, to health, that could help us be more resilient and store good carbon going forward. So those, those are my pros and cons. Awesome, thank you, Laura. Who would like to respond to our question next? biggest challenge and biggest opportunity in your neck of the woods related to forests and climate change? Kenny. <laughs> I did unmute, didn't I? Um, I think uh, some of the, the biggest opportunities is, is forestry is a renewable resource that can be used for so many different things. So uh, some of my thoughts about the challenges is to try and keep the forest productive, active, useful, um, so taking care of things like invasive species, uh, looking at uh, where the market, the, the future markets might be and, and having, having the opportunity to, to use the resource uh, in, a, in a sensible manner is, is kind of cool. And, and some of the, the hidden you know, things that we don't know that we'll know in the future uh, about just the whole dynamics of what tree species will be um, resilient, will be useful for the future societies is, is kind of cool. Great, thank you, Kenny. Alessio, may I call on you next to share from yes. a wildlife perspective, biggest challenge? Um, yeah, well, in terms of opportunities, I definitely think uh, an opportunity for the future is working more together. When I hear Laura mentioning the importance of at the landscape scale, maintaining a diversity of management techniques that's perfectly aligned with uh, the needs of wildlife to have a variety of different habitats, which maximizes the species uh, richness, etc. In terms of challenges, I, I think the, the biggest challenge in the future is going to be to help species move and so track the change in, in climate. So maintaining connectivity so species can sort of make their move uh, easily. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Alessio. Keith, your thoughts? Um, for opportunity, I definitely, I definitely agree with Laura. Um, our markets are not what they once were in this part of the world, um, but we're still better off than just about anybody else. So the, the opportunity for active management of the resource, um, as we learn more about climate impacts is, is, um, is there. And that's a great opportunity. Um, challenge, um, and it's nothing new, um, unpredictability on all the fronts. Um, markets, climate, weather, um, you know, world economy, all that stuff. That's nothing new to us. It just, there's, there's more uncertainty, I think, than there's, there's ever been. You use the analogy of you lived in Millinocket, you went and worked at the mill, it was dependable, right? Um, things aren't like that anymore. Um, so that, that's a challenge. Thank you. Um, we are just about at the top of the hour. Um, 
I think I know there are a few more questions in the chat window, and if our speakers have time to respond to them um, after the top of the hour, I think our, our uh, guests would definitely appreciate it. Um, before I let everybody go, just a quick reminder um, that on Friday, uh, if you're coming to the field tour, and I think we might have um, a few spots available, sign up closes this afternoon, so move quickly. Um, uh, please wear your blaze orange, because for one, Halloween is coming, and it's also uh, still hunting season, and there are a few people with guns in the woods. So please wear your blaze orange this Friday for the field tour. With that, um, please uh, allow me to thank all of you um, uh, participants for joining us. And especially thank you so much to our speakers, to Laura, Kenny, Alessio, Keith, um, and Aaron for hosting, and Meg and Logan for helping <laughs> work everything behind the scenes. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for being part of this. And we look forward to seeing some of you this Friday. Stay safe in the woods. All right. And again, um, for my speakers, there were a few really good questions that, uh, that there's a lot of thank yous rolling in, um, but there were a few questions that popped in. Um, I know you've been able to address most of them, but if you have time to, uh, to just type in a quick response, uh, I think our folks might appreciate it. Um, let's see, 1251, Michael had asked, in regards to working on marine soils in a changing climate, do you see loggers using lighter equipment having an advantage in the future? So if you have a chance to type in a response to that, uh, that would be helpful. I know there was another one that I missed. There was one about equipment size. Woodlots getting smaller and equipment getting larger. Yes. So, uh, yes, yeah, David Brin uh, in Vermont asked, uh, woodlots are getting smaller and equipment is getting bigger. We need to address that. As many folks are uh, also, many folks are willing to manage for timber if other values are not compromised. It is key to enhance water quality, carbon sequestration and storage, wildlife species rich, species richness and flood and drought resilience across the board. Um, Kenny, that might actually be an interesting one for you to address since you're working more with the uh, woodlot owners these days. And uh, I don't know if David Brand is still on the line, but um, if you want yeah. to type, you're welcome to address it out loud or typing, whichever you prefer. I, well, I, I totally agree with David. The situations of woodlots getting smaller, equipment is getting bigger. That also uh, gets to where the equipment is likely to end up with um, smaller lots of wood, uh, a very expensive piece of equipment won't make its money back. So they tend to, to not use smaller lots unless they really have to. And typically that will be on the shoulder season when maybe they shouldn't be operating in the, the types of soil on these lots. Uh, but yeah, it's a, a good question, David, for sure. So the diversity of equipment mix is, is uh, a good thing. Thank you, Kenny. Um, and I think I missed Jake Meyer's question. Uh, we might see, I don't know if we'll see Jake on Friday, but he says, is fir still considered a tree that can be more or less ignored, meaning harvest it if it makes sense and, uh, and money and leave it if it does not make money and doesn't compete with a better tree? <laughs> so what are people's feelings on fir these days? I um, put a brief comment up to that, but I'll just elaborate that. Um, I mean, we recognize the many values of fir, right? It's a prolific cedar, um, good competitor, so it grows rapidly, so good for pulpwood, Christmas trees, fir tipping. I mean, there's lots of things that are good about fir, but the short sort of longevity of fir, um, susceptibility to spruce budworm, the balsam woolly adelgid, and the poor climate outlook does mean that it continues to be a challenge. And so in our management, I know we actively try to manage against fur to try to reduce that component in the ecosystem in part recognizing that we have caused it to so much increase through our past harvesting to a level much greater than it was in the pre-European settlement forest. So we are trying mostly to discriminate against fur, but recognize that growing good fur, if we can harvest them before something happens to them and they die, is a very valid and appropriate thing to do. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. And I'm not going to go on all afternoon with questions. Uh, since we're still recording, I'll read Bren Whitaker's uh, comment out loud. Uh, he says, Jake, you've hit it right on right on in your cut slash leave decisions on fur. Exactly, our 60 year experience on our own lands. Fur is and has been a regular monetary income, but we're still transitioning to a higher percentage of red spruce. So that's over in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. Ah, all right, um, I know everyone has other items on your agenda for today. Um, thanks again so much speakers um, for, for taking the time today. And I really look forward to seeing all of you in the woods this Friday. 
uh, Aaron, Meg, thanks for getting this party together and uh, we'll see you all soon.